Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi everybody at home joining us. Jazakallah khair. We're here today with uh, here with Brother Dean. I'm going to get his last name right today for the first time ever. Isafides. Ah, uh, you got it right. Did yeah. I say it right? Yeah, yeah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah, bro. First time well, for well everybody. Well done, Robbie. Wayakum. <laughs> we're uh, we're really excited today because we've got a couple of beautiful guests who've flown all the way here and driven a long distance to uh, to be to be with us. For people who've been joining us, uh, we've been discussing addiction and stuff in community. Uh, for the for the last few episodes, I'll start them all right. We've got Brother Jay Omar, who's the general manager of the Hadar Clinic. Brother Jazakallah Khair for joining us. How are you doing today? Thank you for that warm welcome, Robbie. Uh, Salam alaikum. Um, really well, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, happy to be here. Really excited. Bro, we really appreciate you taking the time to come down and, and have this discussion with us. I'm sure you'll have a lot of good insights for us, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, we also have Brother Mustafa here. He's a clinical services manager in north central Queensland. Bro, you actually had to fly to be here today. How's your flight? Alhamdulillah. Very uh, very comfortable. It was, uh, yeah, nice and easy. All good. Uneventful. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Uneventful is good when, you, when, when you take it flying planes. 100%. 100%. Brothers, you guys have been working in this in this area for a long time. Jay, how long how long you been involved with rehabs? I've been working uh, in rehabs for over ten years now. Yeah, yeah. And what made you uh, what made you decide to get involved in this industry, Habib? Uh, well, it all happened by mistake, to be honest. Mistake, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, by coincidence or, or or whatever. I um, I was in the trades before, and I just uh, couldn't continue doing that. So I went uh, to uni, and started studying. Mm. And I uh, started on a, uh, doing a uni degree. I got a part-time job in a, in a residential AOD rehab. What was your uni degree in? What was in it? psychology. Okay. Yeah. What, what made you choose that? Uh, it's a broad field. Mm. And it's a really good way to kind of understand why people do what they do. Sure. So it's a very interesting <laughs> subject. It's, it's, it, it was really good. So, yeah, I got myself a part-time job to get me through uni. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. So ten years. I mean, general manager. That's not a small position to be in. I mean, you must you must have worked a lot across a lot of roles within the rehabs to be able to sit in the chair that you are now. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a few different roles uh, over the years. You know, I started out as a support worker. Yeah. And uh, kind of worked through uh, to where I am today. Yep. Mashallah, brother. The Hater Clinic. Tell us about the Hater Clinic. What exactly? What services do they offer? Is it is it just inpatient? Do they do outpatient stuff? Yeah. What's what do you guys offer there? So we got two uh, programs that we offer. Uh, the first program that we have, um, which we opened up a year ago, is a 25-bed uh, AOD mm. uh, withdrawal unit. So it's a detox centre. That's for detox. Yeah, correct. And how long does someone stay in detox for? So our program's modelled around a 28-day stay. So yeah. we don't just believe in dealing with people's symptoms. Yeah. Uh, we also kind of you know provide psychosocial education. So you know if you kind of remove the drugs. Mm then they're left with all these kind of, you know, thoughts and feelings and, you know, how do they navigate through that? So um, our psychosocial program helps people deal with that component as well. So I think, like, from what I've seen around Brisbane, generally, like, if someone wants to detox, they'll go to the hospital and that'll usually take a week and then from there they've got to try and get a bed in an inpatient thing. Does Hater Clinic sort of o- offer all those things in, in one location? Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah, and th- so, so that's the 28 days includes a detox and then the stay after that as well? Yeah, correct. Correct. Okay. So, we, you know, what happens is that people can detox after a seven to ten day period. Yeah. And then they're very, very vulnerable. And uh, essentially what happens is that they'll relapse yeah. a lot of the time unless they've got that additional support. So the 28 day program is designed to kind of minimise that stuff from happening. It still happens, yeah. but it's designed to minimise that from happening. Uh, the other program that we've got there is a uh, 90 day residential program as well so okay. on the same site we have an additional 90 day residential program so again it gives people more time to work with uh work with us and work on the issues that you know got them there in the first place so would someone do the 28 day detox and then book in and, and run straight into the 90 day they certainly can yeah okay yeah well, can you um just for people like that don't uh, i guess you know this terminology and stuff like that can you explain the difference between detox and rehab people yeah sure i'll do my best <laughs> so essentially detox is uh designed to address people's symptomology so you know if you're on alcohol or heroin or amphetamines or benzodiazepines whatever the drug is you need a period where you know you can safely withdraw off those chemicals or substances and essentially uh you know that really needs you know close monitoring you know proper medical attention so, you know, at the detox centres you'll find that, you know, it's uh, staffed by doctors and nurses, etc. Uh, so rehab is where you kind of, after you've detoxed, 
Mm, you start to kind of, uh, you know, work on those things that kind of put you in that position to begin with. So it might be, you know, you'd be working on your behaviour, you'd be working on modifying uh, your thought patterns, you'd be working on modifying, um, you know, relationships. There's a whole bunch of complexities. So you need that time to kind of unpack all that sort of stuff slowly mm. uh, and find, you know, a modality that works for you as well. In terms of success rate like you know i've heard some statistics somewhere along the way and i don't know if this is accurate or not but they say it takes the average person seven to nine visits or something to a rehab before they they kick something completely is, is that accurate or is that just is that sort of bro science look i think there's there's um there's multiple different sort of data sets that show different sort of things but i think you know generally speaking it can take a person up to multiple attempts at before they actually um you know do stay abstinent mm. Um, but uh, it really comes down to the individual as well. Some people it might work the first time, others it might work, you know, require multiple attempts. Now, brother, uh, up north, tell us a little bit about, about what you're doing. What sort of services are you offering? Sure. What's your so, work uh, so I work for, uh, for an NGO, um, Lively Dwell, uh, and we, um, we deliver all sorts of uh, drug and alcohol uh, treatment, predominantly drug and alcohol services, um, all over Queensland and uh, in most parts of Queensland and, and in a couple of parts of New South Wales as well. Yeah. So we offer community uh, programs, so uh, counselling, uh, case management, referral, um, and we also offer uh, programs like day programs, like day rehabilitation programs yeah. for people who can't um, commit to you know uh, a set time uh, in a residential site. Um, we've got residential uh, withdrawals as well uh, and residential rehabs as well across, uh, across the state. I've had some good experiences with lives as well. I refer a lot of people to Logan House, which is run yep. by them. Six-week program. I find it's really attractive for people because it's, I guess it's an easy sell. Like sometimes the idea of saying to someone, look, you need to go to rehab for six months or a year or something like that. It's like, well, I can't put my life on hold for, sure. for a year. I, c I can't do that. But six weeks, most people can sort of set things aside and put something in place to make that happen. So I've had good ex a lot of good experiences with that mob. So uh, do you do you manage the outpatient stuff more yourself? or? So I manage our community-based uh, services from Bundaberg up to Townsville. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, I don't manage any residential services yep. per se, but I manage a, a, a withdrawal, uh, a community-based withdrawal program. It's like an ambulatory-type withdrawal. Mm. So if a person, again, similar to, or like, uh, say for argument's sake, if a person can't commit to staying seven days, in a inpatient um, withdrawal setting, yeah. um, then basically we can support them with a um, with a drug and alcohol uh, nurse or a withdrawal nurse, in collaboration with a, a GP, yeah. um, to basically support that person whilst they're in community, whilst they're at home, to be able to detox and you know they can be medicated and then come and check in with our uh, nurse uh, mm. daily, um, as well as our and and we also wrap around some case management and some support uh, for that person. As well. Talking a little bit about day programs, because again, a lot of people at home don't really that are joining us may not know sort of what things are available and what they look like. And I've got some questions about, um, I guess, day day programs as well myself. Like I find um, a lot of dudes I deal with, a lot of brothers I deal with, will sort of um, who aren't really prepared to commit to rehab. Sort of like, oh, I can do day, you know, day hab sort of stuff, but. For me, it kind of seems like it's almost like a way out. Of it's like I can sort of half commit to getting better, but I sort of don't have to. I can turn up when I need to. Are you finding like you guys are having a lot of success with, with those programs? I, I was told that there's a lot of funding. Government seems to be putting a lot of funding into the, those particular sorts of things sure. at the moment. And I think, look, I mean, part of the reason why government might be channeling funding into day program is because it's it's not as uh, resource intensive. You don't have infrastructure that you need to fund. Makes sense. You know what I mean? It happens at a, a centre um, during business hours, for argument's sake, four days a week or five days a week. Um, it's structured, um, so it's not loose type of thing where people just come in and, and do, yeah. you know, nothing. Mm -hmm. It is structured, um, and typically you would look at uh, a person attending Dayhab um, to be doing the same sort of things and looking at the same types of models um, and the same type of um, uh, treatment that they would receive in a residential setting okay. during the day. Um, but what happens thereafter is once it's time that the day program finishes, they go back to their place of where they live. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... I think it really, you know, it, it, depending on where a person's at and, and what type of supports they have at home, if the home environment is conducive to maintain, like, recovery, if, if the home environment is safe and, you know, um, it's not 
going to pull them in back in the direction of using, then you know, I mean, day have is 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 a good mm. option to have there as well. Well, it makes sense if you've got kids and you've got to work, and you know, it's you yeah, can't absolutely. just leave young kids behind, right? Definitely. A lot of single parents and stuff out there. So yeah, there is, and it makes them it makes it really hard for them to access treatment. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're some of the barriers that you know people out there in the community face. You know, they're, they're a single mum, they've got no family, uh, who's going to look after the kids? Yeah. Look, what what sort of conditions are there around people being accepted into rehab? Um, I found di- difficulty. Um, a lot of brothers coming out of Habas, coming out of jail, um, can find it quite difficult to get accepted into an inpatient clinic because they've got some sort of violent criminal history. Um, some rehabs I've come across have got a small quota as to how many people they'll have at one any one time who've come out of prison for different reasons. So it's. Um, we kind of left wondering, okay, well, someone who's maybe committed some sort of violent crime in the past, he needs help too. He needs to get better. He's committed to it. He's moved on from, from that stuff. But we're finding it very difficult to find help for him. Uh, are all rehabs, do they have the similar sorts of criteria or is it? Look, I think they, they broadly speaking, there, there'd be some similarities. Um, but, you know, each in, I think each, each rehab um, may have different sort of requirements and stuff. Yeah. I'll let Jay answer this one first and then yeah, I'll Yeah, what uh, happens at look, the head of clinic? Uh, for us, uh, we do an assessment. Uh, look, we don't believe in, um, you know, holding people's past against them. That's great. We also, you know, obviously believe in giving people an opportunity. You know, that's just another ridiculous barrier that happens. But you've got to be realistic in that. If someone's a, you know, a violent offender... They've got a really short fuse, they're impulsive mm. and they're going to come there and, you know, upset, you know, 20 or 30 other people because they can't contain their behaviour, yeah. even though, you know, you, you give them an opportunity. Uh, you know, generally, you know, they're, they're the sorts of things that you've got to factor in, otherwise that person's going to be kind of asked to leave treatment, so they're going to have a negative kind of, uh, you know, outcome. Mm. They're going to probably think that they're hopeless. Mm. So we really got to kind of, you know, consider those sorts of things when someone's uh, applying to go into a into treatment program. Mm. Uh, you know, there's some other stuff, you know, that uh, I think in, in general people have, have to consider. So and it all comes down to the assessment and that level of readiness, uh, what stage of change they're, they're at, um, you know, how long since their last defence, for example. Uh, you know, is there any remorse? Uh, okay. You know, so there's a whole bunch of things that kind of generally get, you know, discussed amongst you know clinical team, and they determine the the outcome. Um, and you know, it might mean that they, you know, interview that person in person, you know, a few times, and uh, you know, try and you know, remove those barriers and try and get them into treatment. Oh, that's good. That's good. So it's not written in stone. It's a case by case, and and prepared exactly, to be yeah. flexible and work with people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess that's sort of positive con- considering all the stuff that we've we've ac- encountered like it's there's no real assessment intake process it's just the black and white you know you've got these offenses no you can't come yes you can be accepted sort of thing and it's the guys that we've been you know sort of dealing with it's yeah. trying to get Not help there, trying to get help there's nothing yeah there, so. so look uh, I've, I've worked across a couple of different organizations and and i've seen what happens behind the scenes around some of that stuff uh, you know, again, you know, you don't want it to turn into a jail yard. You know, rehab's yeah. a place for people to feel safe. Community. You know, you don't want people standing around talking out the side of their mouth, you know, with no <laughs> real interest being there. <laughs> uh, you know, you oh, need yeah. to vacate that position for yeah. someone who's desperate and really wants to be there. So, you know, it, it is about finding that balance mm. and it is a case-by-case case basis with most of the organisations that I've dealt with. Talking about, look, what's, what's working well? What do you got, what, what, in terms of treatment, what's working well at the moment? What are you guys having success with? What sort of therapies are there? So for someone who are out there who's watching or their family's watching, who's maybe considering is rehab for me, isn't it? What can they expect when they get in there? What are they going to be doing? We're still on the resi setting, bro. I'll let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go. <laughs> Look, it's, that's a big question, Robbie. And, um, yeah, there's no simple answer to that. But, you know, if, you, if you're thinking that you should be in treatment, yeah. The chances are you should be in treatment okay. and that you should go to treatment. Yep. And I think, uh, you know, finding what the right fit is for you, you know, inquiring, looking at what type of models there are. But again, you know, that, that brings up its own complications because a lot of people have an idea about what rehab should look like and what it should be like. Mm. And the reality on the ground is that, you know, it's a completely different thing. So, um, you know... And can I just also jump in there and just just say that you know what works well is when the individual, the person who's seeking treatment themselves, is actually on board and w- 
at that stage of readiness to change. Nice. You know what I mean? So if that person is not at that point, you can throw whatever you want at them in terms of treatment interventions, in terms of support, everything possible. But if that person's not that, at that stage yet, no matter what you, 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 you put in front of them, yeah. it, it won't be effective. Yeah. So that's... You take a horse to work. Uh, I agree. Yeah. And, and what you find is uh, most treatment centres, you know, operate, you know, uh, with evidence-based treatment models. Mm-hmm. So they're not reinventing the wheel. Mm-hmm. They're, they're generally kind of uh, implementing, you know, what's been researched and what's, you know, what's what, what works. Uh, but, you know, there are, you know, a range of other places that might kind of, you know, incorporate some stuff that, you know, isn't evidence-based. So just be on the lookout for, you know, what the um, treatment modalities are that are being used. Mm. Uh, you know, like having a uh, juice detox uh, <laughs> isn't going to get you clean, eating organic food. <laughs> I mean, know. we laugh about it, though, but we laugh about it. But there, there are settings like that, you know. There was one, um, you know, that, that I was looking at uh, many years ago, and, um, and it involved um, taking vitamins and intensive sauna treatment and um that was the fifty thousand dollars a month yeah (laughs) well you know i mean it was uh you know so yeah look i absolutely agree i think you know people before they're accessing treatment Mm. should um you know maybe do a bit of background checks and just ensure that you know it is an evidence-based approach guys um might sort of change the direction of this conversation a little bit because i'm i'm I'm, i guess people out there will be thinking the same sort of thing but i'm interested to see you know, why you guys have stepped into this space, you know, what sort of bit of your background or what's, you know, led you to come and, you know, be in these positions. Obviously, sure. you know, something that probably resonates with all of us is the fact that we've had experiences and that we want to give back. Um, I sort of get that vibe from you guys as well, mm-hmm. you know, being in those positions. Um, you know, these people at home, they, you know, they want to connect and understand, uh, you know, pe- people, individuals and the people that they're speaking to a, b- a little bit better, I guess. So, you know, tell us a little bit about the stuff that you guys have been through and um, I know you, your past, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so, just a lot for uh, yeah, for, 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 uh, for steering. Just chucking it, uh, chucking it. Yeah, <laughs> look, I mean, it's, <laughs> Thanks you know. Thanks for me, mate. <laughs> no, no, look, I think, I think it's important to make the conversation personal and yeah. to, you know, really identify what that connection is. And, um, you know, for me, um, so I'm of Egyptian heritage, born and raised in Melbourne, um, spent, um, you know, the first 30 years of my life in, in Melbourne, um, you know, went to school, grew up sort of um, with this identity of being a, a young Muslim, you know, my father, mashallah, you know, very knowledgeable, well-respected man in the community, um, did a lot in terms of, you know, uh, giving back to the Muslim community. And so, you know, I was lucky to have had, um, you know, a role model like that in my life um, who taught me, um, you know, just an, an incredible amount of, of knowledge and stuff that I now look back on and, or you know, when I was sort of late 30s, look back on and thought, subhanAllah, like my dad gave me some gold, you know, but at the yeah. time when he was giving me the gold, I didn't see it as gold, you know, because, um, uh, you know, as any young um, sort of kid where you're growing up in a society where you're the minority, um, you know, you... Um, you almost felt to made to feel uh, different, and yeah. um, and so I think that's something that uh, that most uh, Muslim youth would probably have um, an experience with is is that feeling of um, identity yeah, crisis identity and, crisis, and, and yeah. where do I fit in? You know, I'm a, you know a square peg trying to fit in a round hole, and you know how do I make this work? So there's that challenge there that that Muslim kids have growing up in in, in Australia, and um, and you know I had some of those challenges, you know, as a kid growing up. Um, didn't quite feel like I belonged. Um, and so, you know, you get to an age and when you get to your sort of adolescence and stuff, you know, and people and you have influences and stuff around you, you make choices and you make decisions. And, um, you know, subhanAllah, like to, to a large extent, I think the foundation that my dad set for me, uh, the Islamic foundation, um, you know, really set me up quite well. Um, but then as I grew older, um, you know, it was, um, things came about and, um, you know, substances was, was, um, part of those things. And, um, you know, when they're presented to you, uh, you make choices and, um, you know, and there were occasions where, uh, you know, where I probably didn't make, uh, the, you know, the, the best of choices. And so, um, subhanAllah, like it's, um. <coughs> And, and, and those choices and I suppose the, um, the people who I was surrounded with, um, you know, you think that you raise your, your kids around other Muslims yeah. and you think they'll be safe uh, with, with other Muslims. Mm. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, ultimately I'm responsible for the choices that I made. 
but a lot of those influences were from my Muslim mates, yes, you know, right. and uh, and that's 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 challenging because you know at the, you have you come to this sort of dilemma where it's like, well, you know, hang on, you know, my, my non-Muslim mates, if I go to a party, uh, you know, a, a friend's birthday party or something. And my non-Muslim mates know that I'm staunch and I don't drink, you know, because it's, it's against my religion, you know. So all through growing up in school, no, don't drink. I won't touch that. don't want a bar of it. But then what happens when your Muslim mates put it in front of you? Yeah. And it's like, what, 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 what's going on here, you know? So you have this, this pause in this moment, you know. So anyway, look, I'm, by no means am I sort of trying to shift or, or you know, I'm just, I suppose, probably tr- going back to your question is that, um, you know, um, I grew up, uh, with some challenges and um, and uh, alhamdulillah uh, by the grace of Rabbi subhanahu wa ta'ala I was uh, able to overcome those uh, those challenges and through supports and mentors and, and community and, and a range of different uh, things um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in my path um, I was able to uh, to overcome um, those uh, those challenges and um, and you know found myself similar to uh, my brother jay um you know uh, accidentally sort of landed into this um this way of work um but uh you know quite passionate about it and um have seen with my own eyes people as we've all seen you know people come from all walks of life um have 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 come from a point of desperation and despair mm. and 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 you know not knowing an out and not even knowing or acknowledging that there is an out particularly when you go down the path of, of using drugs and alcohol, it can get you deep and it can get you real deep and to that point where it's like, what do I do here? And so to actually know and acknowledge that, you know, there is an out, you know, um, and we can support people out of that, then, you know, like what what, what a gift, what an what, what, what incredible gift to give back to uh, to the community. So, oh, Jazakallah. And look, guys, it's not, um, don't think of it as putting you guys on the spot or anything like that. I'll tell you the wisdom behind it and the reason why I'm asking this is because I guess a lot of the viewers out there, a lot of young guys um, in our community especially, struggle to find role models, okay? Str- struggle to find examples of people that they can be like. And it's it's important for you guys in your position, you know, alhamdulillah from what we know of you guys, you know, very upright, um, successful men, inshallah, in your you know, respective fields. Um, and it's important for these youngsters to see people like you that have, you know, if they're looking at you guys and you haven't had a past, they're not even going to bother sure. because it doesn't relate to them in their situation. But, you know, I think there's not anyone, anyone here in this room uh, that hasn't had a past and, you know, um, to, to, to what extent, um, you know, and is, is able to turn their lives around. So it gives these young guys a bit of hope seeing, mm. you know, guys that are, you know, in your positions, alhamdulillah, that have been able to turn their lives around from whatever experiences yeah. they've been through and, you know, um, you know, end up in a successful position. Jay, what have you seen, brother, in your own life? Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Sydney. Okay. In a lovely place called Green Acre. Oh, mashallah. <laughs> okay, so you've seen it all, brother. I have. Bro, what does drugs take from a person? What, what have you seen in your own life growing up? What's, what's been your own personal experience? Oh, I've seen drugs take everything from people. You know, I'm not talking about the material stuff, like, you know, their money, their car, their house, you know, or, or their wives. It takes their soul. Mm. Yeah, completely, uh, I've seen it ruin people to a point of desperation where, you know, they're chronically suicidal, uh, have no more purpose, um, you know, just no hope whatsoever. Um, and, and going back to uh, you know what Dean was saying, um, you know the reason why I do what I do is I love being of service. I love seeing that glimmer of hope coming back because you know when you're in that position, you often don't know that there's a way out. It's a bloody hopeless yeah feeling. Yeah, it's a very empty, it's dark, a very place dark place. To be. place exactly right. Mm. Yeah, and um, you know if it wasn't for people you know uh, uh, who carry that message. Mm of hope that there is a way out mm. and deliver, you know, uh, appropriate support, you know, whether they be programs or, you know, words of wisdom or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, people like myself wouldn't be alive today. So, that's you know, that's, uh, that's just the black and white truth of it all. Mm. Uh, you know, I identify a lot with uh, what uh, Brother Mustafa said there, um, you know, uh, and, and I feel blessed and privileged that that hasn't, been my life today you know a lot of hard work's uh gone into uh you know staying on the straight and narrow mm. and that's where i like to keep it these days so yeah you know, and and there's a lot of things that i've had to do over the years you know uh you know but there was a stage in my life as well where you know i couldn't um 
yeah, stop using, you know, for even one hour, you know, wow. let alone a day. So, but you know, that was a very long time ago, and alhamdulillah, uh, alhamdulillah. things have moved on significantly since then. So, you know, firsthand, I uh, understand that there is a way out, uh, but yeah, it's going to take a lot of work. Mm. Yeah, it's not going to happen overnight. You can't just sit there wishing for it. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you got to put in the action, mm. and you got to take the support that's there. Look, most of the phone calls I get when it comes to people looking for help is generally not from the person themselves. And I guess I'm a, in a different um, uh, part of the uh, of the whole process, I guess, to where you guys are at. You guys are, are in, I think, in a really beautiful place to be where they're coming to you and saying, I want help, and you're getting to participate in them, wanting to, wanting to, to get that help and getting better. Where I'm kind of at the other end of it where I'm dragging people around trying to convince them that, that there is hope and that they should should get help, which is, as you know, a very difficult thing to do. But most of the fa- phone calls I get aren't from the people looking for help, it's from the families. And of those phone calls, most of them, it's the mothers. Mm. Pulling up, listen, my son, he started smoking pot. Mm. He started doing this. I found this uh, powder, some stuff, a pipe, whatever. And they're beside themselves. They don't know what to do. They say, look, you know, we're trying to talk to him, but we don't want to push him away. And, uh, you know, we don't know what to do. And... Uh, Honestly, we d- it's it's a really hard thing to know how to advise the families, and because the f- the families like, oh, can you help them? But you know, w- well, yeah, we'd love to, and we'd love to refer them on to something. But as you said before, Moose, it's um, unless the individual's willing. So, I mean, you guys must get phone calls from families all day, every day, saying, "My son, my husband, my wife, or whatever." What do you do? What do you say to these people? For families specifically, I think that, look, we, we do offer um, programs that support the family members of loved ones. You do? Um, so, yes, we do. Oh, that's um, amazing. So sorry I left that one out. No, we, do offer, cool. we, we do also offer gambling <coughs> support as well. Um, but that's, that's, that's an inter-referral um, program that we have. So if a person presents, they're wanting to address their drug and alcohol problem, yeah. and then through that initial intake and assessment process, it flags that they could have gambling issues as well, then we'll actually uh, provide them with a, a, a referral into our gambling program. But um, there are programs set up um, supporting uh, family members. Um, and even if, for argument's sake, the person that they're supporting or their loved one or their significant other isn't at the point where they want to change, at least we can provide support to the family member mm. to allow them to build the resilience within them to be able to sustain, to be able to look after themselves um, whilst the loved one is on their journey um, and not really at that point of wanting to change and also give them the tools to not, um, what's the word, it always escapes me, um, where you basically facilitate or allowing uh, someone to... Uh, enable. Enable, <laughs> enable, thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you. It escapes me all the time. <laughs> so you give them the skills so that they don't enable yeah. their loved one to continue, you know, on that path. Because that's a hard one, it the is. enabling. Because Absolutely. You, you know what, your son's coming to you, he, oh, mom, I need money for food, I'm hungry. Yeah. And she breaks, oh, here's $20, $20, $20, and he's yeah. going to get on. Mm. Or, you know, we've got families where one child is using. We literally had one one brother who used him used over years, ended up dying as a result of uh, of his drug use, Ali Hummel. Then Sorry. now his younger brother is following in his footsteps. And now mm. there's other younger brothers in there, and the mum wants to – she doesn't want to kick her son out, but she does, and she's torn between do I kick him out or don't I because it's like, okay, well – if he stays in there sure. and he keeps doing what he's doing, then it's going to pass on to the next kid. And so, yeah, the parent finds himself in a position of what do I do? Oh, he needs money, he's a poor thing, haram, he needs to eat, but then he's getting on. What do I do? Am I enabling him by letting him stay in the house? Like, where's the line? So it'd be yeah. a blurry place, eh? Hey? Yeah. And that should, that, like, that, that situation, subhanAllah, like, that should highlight how much this has a hold on you. Mm. You know, these addictions have a hold on you. You know, your your older brother, subhanAllah, you've seen, has passed away from whatever you, you know, whatever substances they've used. That should be your wake-up moment, your light bulb moment that, you know what, this is where I'm headed if I continue doing what I'm doing. And that, not even that sort of, you know, has, has an effect. It's, yeah, it, 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 it is the reality. Addictions impact the whole family. Mm. And, um, mm. you know, a, as a result, you know, a whole bunch of stresses start to kind of manifest and, you know, not only does it impact them emotionally, it can start to impact them physically, uh, financially, uh, and all that stuff, that enabling stuff is just classic. Mm. Oh, but, you know, he needs to eat. Mm. You know, oh, but he needs somewhere to sleep. Well, 
you know, I, I take a different position on that. The more you enable, uh, the more you kind of letting that addiction kind of thrive. Yeah. Yeah. You remove all that stuff. Uh, that person's probably going to get to their knees a bit quicker. It's a harsh thing to say, and it's a harsh thing for families to to watch to do. Mm. But it's probably you know, you know, uh, a, a good way to get them you know closer to accepting help. So one of the lines that we we, we always say is that you know we're going to support you in, in in your recovery, but we're not going to support you in your addiction. Mm. So we we get. Most of our inquiries come from families. You know, they're desperate, they're broken, they're absolutely you know, at their wits end. They've been traumatised for the last 10 years, even longer sometimes. Mm-hmm. My son, my daughter, you know, my husband, my wife, whatever. And, um, you know, uh, we certainly have to, you know, provide support for them. And sometimes mm-hmm. we'll work with families, you know, for quite a number of months before, you know, they find that window of opportunity, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to push their loved one into treatment. So you guys will help. You guys can help support the families to be to support their loved one, to encourage them to get to get help and seek help. And with us, it's if they're looking at genuinely coming into our treatment program, we certainly support the families. Okay. Um, yeah, prior and during uh, their loved one's treatment, because we also kind of need to provide them with the education about what's this all going to look like mm. now that your loved one hasn't got, you know, alcohol or drugs in their system mm. and, you know, what's a healthy dynamic going to look like? Mm. And, yeah. and that's important. Like we, we, we've dealt with some guys that, um, you know, these people constantly going in and out of rehab, you know, they'll try their best and, and, and make a, a decent effort to try and clean themselves up, mm. come back home, the family from cultural background mm. doesn't understand, never seen drugs apart from that, that child yep. that's using not not have any skills whatsoever to try and deal with this addiction or the situation that they're in and you know subhanallah comes back in doesn't have the tools yeah. falls straight back into addiction you know the all the answer to them is just shipping back to rehab you know inshallah this time will be the time yeah and yeah it's, I, I i feel it's really important that you know these families yeah. have some sort of support and, and they're able to speak to someone mm. you know outside of <laughs> brother Robbie, yeah. that they're they, able they, to they also need to be willing to be yeah. engaged as well That's yeah. right. you know because a lot yeah. of the times that it's not our problem yeah it's their problem yeah. they're the, they're the, they're the alcoholic yeah. or they're the addict mm. You know, we're okay, mm. but, you know, not understanding the, the complexity of, of, you know, relationships and mm. those sorts of dynamics, you know, in the, within the family unit. So, and even that, that, that codependency that the parents have yeah. with their kids or yeah. with their loved one or the husband has with the wife or vice versa. Mm. And then, you know, what happens thereafter, like Brother Jay was saying before, you know, the person recovers and gets well. Well, what does that relationship look like when for so long, for so many years or months or whatever, that other person was on this path and on this journey of trying to rescue their loved one and trying to help them. And then all of a sudden the loved one's back and they're sort of, you know, getting used to that transition. Well, what does that then look like, you know? Mm-hmm. And do they have the skills to be able to, you know, navigate that path and that journey as well with that, with that, uh, you know, their loved one. Yeah. Something you guys, um, you know, with, with, with your, uh, both your different programs, I guess, um, something that's incorporated into these programs, um, changing the, um, how do I say this? The, environment that this person comes back into is that something you guys focus on because i think that's something that we've we've seen a lot of the case where mm. these people um you know the, the problem with the family is one thing but then coming back and living in that whatever that wherever area they're living in that's conducive to using same mm. house same, same street house, same, same street dealers. same deals yeah. yeah same same you know same environment um is that something you guys incorporate or, or, or highlight in your programs for these people so I mean, look, upon uh, exiting treatment, um, every person goes through a bit of a, a relapse prevention plan and, a, you know, a, a, a post-resi uh, um, plan. So once they're back, you know, about to transition back into community, well, what are the things that need to be considered or looked at before they actually go out to, you know? And a lot of the times it does involve, you know, changing the playmates, play places, play things, you know, and it, it, for it to be sustainable and... and, uh, and you know, for them not to fall back into those old, um, you know, bugaboos and traps, everything needs to change everything. in a lot of cases. Yeah, well, everything. Absolutely you know, everything. Yeah. That's my experience, you know, I'm sure, you know. Yeah, look, there's a, there, there are a lot of temptations, triggers, and a lot of, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there needs to be a level of willingness to address all those sorts of things, you know, uh, prior to leaving treatment or, you know, even if you're not in treatment, that, you know, if you want to change things you got to change the environment you got to be all in right you got to be all in because you've got everything to lose 
hundred percent. Even if I mean, if, if, even if you feel like, and I think a lot of people do feel like you've got nothing. But I can also say you've got equally got everything to gain. That's you right. know, like if you've yeah. been on a path and on a journey of self destruction and dereliction, mm. and you know, if you can relate to what that actually looks like, you know, but that's all you know. So for a period of time, all you've known is this safe, sp- what you thought was initially a safe space which was, you know, using and this and that and blah, 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 blah. That was your safety. But all of a sudden, that thing that was your safety has turned on you, yeah? And you're at a point now where it's like, I'm using, but it's not doing what it was once upon a time doing for me. Mm. You know what I mean? It's not giving me the respite that it once upon a time used to. It's actually just exacerbating it. And it's not even a Band-Aid anymore. Once upon a time, I was putting a Band-Aid on on the issue through drugs or alcohol use or whatever the addiction is. Mm. But now, you know, because my tolerance is, is way up here, you know, it's not even doing that. Doesn't so, do that. So you're at this point where it's like, well, halas, like, what are my options? You know, my mm. doors are closed. So, yes, recovery is hard work. There's no ifs or buts about it. It is. It's hard work it, it, and it's ongoing, you know. It's not something once you've got it, that's it, I've got this, yeah. mm. you know. Um, it's, it is. It's something that's ongoing, but you've got everything to gain. And, you know, by actually being open-minded and willing to the fact that, you know what, this might actually just work for me. It's, I've seen it work for other people. And that was my experience. I've seen it work for other people. And, you know, maybe I can have that. Maybe I can, I can probably yeah. attain that. So I've got to put aside all this thinking that I have been holding on to, yeah, and this, 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 this ego. Because when you're in addiction, you're, you're self-absorbed, you're self-consumed, you're running off ego. It's I know, I know, I know. No, 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 no. That needs to be completely deflated. Yeah, yeah? it needs to be completely, and you've got to be at a place of humility. And sometimes that humility needs to be beaten out of you through your addiction. You know what I mean? Mm. Jay was talking about that state being on your knees, you know, where you're like, Yadob, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I can't do this anymore. What are my options? What's left for me to do? You know? And, and, and it does. It requires, a, but you've got the world to gain. Yeah. You know? And if you ever get to a point where you've tried this avenue, yeah, it's hard work. Try it. And if it doesn't work, you can go back to using. Yeah, that's it's all still yeah. there. It's, it's all waiting for you. Yeah. All your drug yeah, dealers and your that. drug buddies yeah. and, the, and the environments and all that stuff. So it doesn't away. go anywhere. Yeah. And you can go back and you can pick up where you, yeah. where you left off. And it doesn't get better. It never ever gets better. Yeah. Every person that I've experienced and had anything to do with that's ever been on this path and that have gone back out there and started using again and then I come back and I see him again. Never once have they said, bro, I've come back, you know, so you could come and join me. Yeah, I mean, it's great out there. You know, it, it's never. You know, they come back and they're in a, a, a more desperate state, in a whole world of pain and shame and desperation. It's like, man, you know, it's like, subhanAllah, like, I'm so grateful for the point that I've gotten to because, you know, I remember what that's like. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Never, ever want to go back there because it's, it's not fun. <laughs> So, Paula, you, you mentioned Melbourne, Melbourne uh, <laughs> earlier on as well. I've just got back from a trip from Mel, uh, to Melbourne. And, subhanAllah, so I have never, ever seen so many addicted people mm. in the city mm. anywhere in my life than I did in, on this trip to Melbourne. Know. You know, it's yeah. increasingly and, – and Muslims as well. Mm. And like you're saying about this humility and stuff, if, they, if, you've, got, if you've got the humility to be able to sit on the side of the street, mm. you know, in that state and begging for money – for to use for drug you know your drug use it's kind of apply that same amount of effort that you're doing that mm. to trying to get help you know and, and these people they just it, it it saddens me you know and giving these people money you know these beggars on the street and stuff knowing that you, know, you can obviously tell by their state that they, they're either still using or they're going to go use or whatever the case may be but it's like it is starting to get i don't know what you guys see up north but it's starting to get worse i had a, a recent trip to sydney as well yep. same sort of thing every yep. time i go down there it seems like it's just these places are getting worse and we're not too far yeah. off at ourselves up here but you know what, what do you guys see in terms of in, in let's ask the, the real question here i guess muslims in your centers in your you know coming across your 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 desks do you guys see a lot of our muslim brothers and sisters that are you know, struggling with addiction and stuff up north? Is our community more immune than anyone else to no. this problem? No. no I, I think, you Should know, it doesn't matter what community you come from, it, you know, this, this addiction doesn't discriminate, you doesn't know, it gets you, whether you're Muslim, uh, whether you're privileged or not, you know, addiction can take a hold of you. But, yeah, to answer your question, Brother Dean, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be straight up, you know, in, in my 10 years, I've probably seen 10 Muslims come through our doors. It's not a lot. Yeah, no. So, yeah. Okay. And, and there's big reasons for that, you know. Yeah, it's very taboo in the community. Mm. Uh, they hide it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not, yeah. 
I, I often get phone calls, uh, you know, such and such, but we need to keep it hush hush. And yeah, I've, I've had those you know, calls, all yeah. those calls and stuff like that. And it's just like, okay, well, you know, what can I do then? <laughs> you know, if he doesn't want to, you know, put the action in and put yeah, uh, and, and and go get some help, there's not much we can we can really do. Mm. Yeah, you know, addiction is really powerful. It's it's got control of that person at this point in time, and you know, their kids aren't keeping them clean, their mothers aren't keeping them clean. Their, you know, their jobs aren't keeping them clean. Their bank balances aren't keeping them clean. None of that stuff matters. You've literally got generational, you know, we've talked about it before, but you see it. And I mean, I've known when I was in the scene in that generations of, 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 of drug addicts, only one family, the grandfather was a, a speed, an amphetamine cook. And uh, he got done with, at the time that he got done, I think it was the largest um, amphetamine bust ever at, at right. that time many years ago. He had two sons and a daughter involved them in the business immediately. So they started using and injecting amphetamines at a very young age, knew how to cook, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. They had kids. Those kids got straight involved in it. You know what I'm saying? It can can be, yeah. Poor buggers. When we talk about hope, I mean, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to Muslim parents on the phone and they're telling me, look, we've raised him, you know, with Quran and prayer and and good values and he's doing that. I'm like, okay, yeah, but okay, so you've given him the foundations and they are there and you still love and care for them. And sometimes that's that's you've do, you've done your best. I mean, mm. we talk about Nuh alayhi salam. If a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa taala mm. couldn't even convince his son, and it son. shows us it's not that's all right. in our hands. It's this right. mad panic. But at least, and I give them examples of these. You know, the grandfather, son, and grandchildren using, and it's like, alhamdulillah, your kid knows what normal is supposed to look like at mm. least, and what deen is supposed to look like, and what that is. So they've got a true north to come back to. At some stage. But some people just can't get it through their head. I don't understand. I, I put him in his memorizing court. And why mm. is this happening? Sure. This is life. That's right. And it doesn't discriminate like uh, Brother Jay was saying before, you know. It's, um, it, it doesn't pick and choose. doesn't matter. And, and I think that, that way of thinking can often exacerbate the problem. So what I grew up thinking was that in order for a person to qualify for being a drug addict or dependent or alcoholic or whatever the case may be, you needed to have had this happen to you, you needed to have lived in this environment, you needed to have blah, 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 blah. And then if that was your experience, then that equals basically one plus one equals two, you know, but it's not like that, you know what I mean? And so, you know, when you see these things um, and you grow up with that putting a person in a box, yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, Muslim communities can do that, you know what I mean? Like, or our way of thinking is like, well, that one plus one equals two, you know? If you think like that, that can actually exacerbate the problem because for me, growing up, I thought, well, you know, if that didn't happen to me and that didn't happen to me, that didn't, then maybe I don't have a problem, mm. you know? So I'm, I'm all right because I'm not doing that or that wasn't my experience. So what that does is that, that if, if you believe in your own mind that I don't have a problem, then it's going to take you a lot longer before you actually start to acknowledge and seek yeah. help because you're living in this bubble saying, I'm actually all right. I'm Muslim. Muslims don't become addicts. Yeah. You know? Like I'm, I, grew up, I didn't grow up in that home environment. You know? Alhamdulillah, that didn't happen to me. You know? I can still sort of function. You know? So I'm only on the pipe. I'm not on the needle. You know? That's right. You know? And there's really always those yet. <laughs> it's always, yeah, oh, well, I'm not doing that. But then once you do that, because that's a, that's, that's, that's a thing about addiction, you know? We say cunning, baffling, and powerful. Mm. You know? Drugs and alcohol, you know? It is. And um, I fully, you know, to- totally uh, agree with that. Is that, you know, it, it can have you in a state where you. Uh, you know, you start off and it's like, it's, like, it's like the trick of the shaitan, you know what I mean? The shaitan will um, get in your head and try to whisper about the slightest, the, the smallest possible sin. It's, oh, it's not that bad. You're just doing that. It's, it's, at least you're not doing that, that, that. Yeah, well, you know word, what I mean? That's exactly how the Yeah, at least I'm not doing that, that, that. Word. But then once you're on that path, then all of a sudden you're doing the next, the next thing. next thing, yeah. And then you're still justifying it and saying, well, at least I'm not doing that. It's at least I'm that. not doing that. Same thing with drugs. You pick up a cigarette, you know, or you pick up a vape, you know, in today's society. You know, I started smoking cigarettes. And my dad's biggest, like, concern when I started smoking at a young age, he said, Mustafa, I'm worried about what this opens the doors to for you. 
And subhanAllah, like my dad's harm reduction approach, what he tried with me, he said, look, and, and when he realized that his interventions and, and the way he was trying to educate, and mashallah, my dad's a you know, science teacher. So he went down that path of trying to get me to, you know, he made me write an essay on the, the, the harmful impact <laughs> of smoking <laughs> when, I was, when I was a kid, mashallah. you know. And, um, but for <laughs> me, as it. a kid, you think to yourself, you know, by the time these adverse effects kick in, you know, like I would have been quit well and truly. But had you have told me when I was 50, you know, when I was at that age and I was smoking cigarettes that, you know, and my dad's fear, it came true. He said, if, if you're inclined to smoking cigarettes, he goes, you're going to be more open to smoking weed or you might be more open to this, 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 this. So his approach was don't go smoke outside because if you're going to smoke, you smoke at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so at least that way you're in a safe environment. You're not mixing with the people who you would typically go go to school and, 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 and smoke with, you know? And so that was his approach to try and contain it, you know what I mean? To try and be supportive so that I wasn't going out and, and, and doing all those things. But his fear, you know, it came true. So, you know, I was smoking cigarettes and then all of a sudden when the option of, you know, weed came up, it's like, well, oh, well it's not that bad. I'm already smoking. Yeah, I'm already smoking. Yeah. And my Muslim mates are doing it. Yeah. So, you know, what does this mean? It must mean that maybe it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You I know? can do both, that's right. Yeah, so. and then once you kind of get dependent, you develop an addiction to this stuff. None of that stuff matters. Mm. Man, don't care. We were saying you that before the show. It. Yeah, we were saying that, and it, it just clicked to me when you were when you were saying that. Uh, you know about the, your father and smoking and stuff. Mm. It's I guess that it's the addiction. It's the addictive um, perspective of mm. uh, or, or addictive component of the process. It's not about the thing, you know. Right. So, like we were saying about shifting addiction from you know drugs mm. to food or, or whatever the case may be. So you're you get used to smoking that cigarette, mm. and it's it's the addic yeah. addictive factor of it, mm. you know. You or when I'm stressed or wh whatever the case may be, you're doing in your life, you're picking up that smoke, you're having it, yeah. then you put that down, then all of a sudden, it, whatever else is placed in front of you, mm. you're going to have those addictive traits with that, whatever it yeah. is, you know. Yeah. So Yeah, it becomes hard. a maladaptive behaviour, you know, so you start to kind of depend on that to, you know, get through things, emotional things, it all, you know, it just starts to creep its way mm. into your life in every area of it. So, you know, yeah, we want to have fun, let's do drugs. Yeah. Uh, I want to I forget, I want to avoid, let's do drugs. Mm. I want to... Uh, Whatever, let's do drugs. That's true. <laughs> so yeah, it can true. become, you know, all consuming, you know, very quickly. You know, I'm just talking about the gateway drug, you know, started with cigarettes and, you know, the progression of it. And, um, you know, unless people are, are, are really open to getting that uh, intervention or really being open minded, you know, they will take that pathway because. Yeah, the, the the trajectory on drugs is is just one way, you know, yeah. and it's not and it's not sustainable. No, it's know? not. No. And yeah, it, you're gonna crash and burn whether you're high functioning, high flying executive, whatever, or you know you're your you know uh, guy that's sleeping on a park bench, drinking out of a paper bag. Mm. You know, it all ends up the same way if you keep going with it. And yeah, you know, I suppose uh, you know. Removing yourself from that state of being, yeah, you know, is the trick. You know, not not buying that story that your head's telling you that you're still okay or, mm -hmm. you know, that everything's fine. You know, um, being open to listening to you know those that care about you. That hey, maybe you need a bit of help. Yeah, you know, right. maybe. Subhanallah. Just a quick, quick, short story on that exact thing. Right. Like I said, I was in Melbourne. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I like to speak to these people that are on the street and whatever and just, you know, if I'm giving them charity, whatever the case may be, just, you know, find out, you know, what, what's your situation? Why are you, like, why are you here? SubhanAllah, this lady, you know, she was a middle-aged lady. She said, you know, she had a couple of minute talk about the situation. She said, three months ago, I was a big manager of Commonwealth Bank here in the city. Three months ago. And this lady looked like she'd been living on the street for years. SubhanAllah. I said to her, like, how, how does that happen? You know, going from three three months ago, you're in the Commonwealth Bank to here. She said, my addiction, you know. She said, I've got no family. My addiction made me lose my my husband. Yep. My husband left, couldn't sustain my job. Mm. So from there, I had no family, no money, no income. She said, lost my house, and here I am. Yep. And she's just, you know, from one extreme to the other, yep. just there, you know. And it happened so quick. Like mm. that, mm. you know, subhanAllah. And yeah. the funny thing is, like, I think... Going back to the point of, you know, where it starts and where it ends, you know, I've never met any individual who's ever come to the point where they're at the end of their journey and they're on their knees and the, their whole life is is controlled by their addiction. If you, you go, up, go up to any individual and say, 
let's wind back 10 years, 20 years when you first picked up whatever it was that you picked up. If I told you that this is where you'd end up, a laughy. No one is that it. not a chance? No. Like if you ask any person yeah. that's developed an addiction, mm. did you have career goals of becoming you know dependent or an addict or an alcoholic? I say mm. no way, no way, not me, not me. But yeah, you, oh. yeah, and it can happen to absolutely anyone. Yeah, absolutely anyone. So I think we need to really be mindful and conscious that in it, it does exist and can exist and can happen to anyone in our community. It yep. doesn't discriminate. And for Muslims, I think we need to create at least be open to the conversation of acknowledging that, yes, this is something. And yes, drugs and alcohol in Islam, it's, it's taboo. You know, it's often a taboo thing that we, 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 in many cases, try and sort of push to the side and not our community, not in our schools, not in our family. But yes, yeah. it yeah. does. And, and, you know, to, 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 to be contained and be like, you know, I've got, I've got to white knuckle this and try and, you know, hide this because it brings upon shame and guilt upon my family. No, no, you need to reach out. You need to ask for support. You know, you need to get beyond that, oh, well, what are the community going to say? It doesn't matter what the community says. Mm. You've, you've, you need help. You need help and you need to access the resources and the tools and the supports that's going to give you help. Yeah, and they're out there. And it just, it requires engaging, you know? Yeah. Well said, Moose. Thanks. Well said. <laughs> Brothers, listen, Jazakallah Khair for coming and joining us today. We've, uh, we're running out of time now, so we'd like to, we're would like we going to have to say goodbye. But, Jay, really, thank you for travelling all this way to come down and see us. We really uh, appreciate you and your insights. Mel, lots of time. Pleasure to meet sure with you doing. guys, and uh, thank you for the privilege of Jazakallah. coming to share some thank stuff you. with you guys. Jazakallah Khair. And Brother Mustafa, thank you for your insights, bro. You're a beautiful uh, man. And uh, I'll reward you and, and, and I mean, bless you in everything that you're doing, inshallah. Yeah, everyone at home thank you for joining us look and you know if you are struggling with addiction if you are using if, if you're finding it hard to stop don't be shy to reach out and get help you can contact us here we're at academy alive you can reach out to anyone in the community go to your local mosque talk to someone these guys at the Hayter Clinic, the brothers, uh, the, the services all over the place. Lives Live Well is really good. Google them, look them up, call them, contact me, contact Dean. And um, and as Brother Mustafa said beautifully before, you've only got everything to gain. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.